For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating tonight? At least I think it's Tuesday. I don't know what day of the week it is anymore. Uh, after a big holiday weekend, uh, some people think it's Monday. Some people think it's Tuesday. Some people may even think it's Sunday if they've got a hangover. Who knows what day it is? But whatever day it is, we are celebrating tonight. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists, and there is a lot to celebrate if you take the time to do so. And tonight we are celebrating the release of this great book, Greece. Tell me more, tell me more. And I am so excited to welcome back to this show uh, someone who has become a friend, at least I like to call him a friend, and that's Ken Waysman. And he uh, is so much a part of this book. He, along with Tom Moore, Adrienne Borbeau, uh, they worked on this book together uh, with a cast of thousands, should I say. Uh, how many people worked together on this book? And this book, I had uh, Tom on the show two nights ago, and this book truly is a baby that was born out of COVID. That's true. That's true. Actually, you asked how many, about, I'd say at least 100 or more. Yes. We were yes. involved in, in all of this. And it started because during COVID, well, first of all, the Grease family has always stayed together, you know, ever since uh, the show and all the different tours and everything. And because people in the tours would come to Broadway or a place, or they, somebody from Broadway would go out to the tourist or play somebody, uh, they all got, everybody got to know each other and everybody was in the same age bracket. And also the way the show's instructed, there's no like star and then there's bit players. You know, every, it's an ensemble, so everybody has their moment. And uh, so friendships were made that have lasted. We had periodic um, uh, reunions in different places um, uh, before the pandemic. But during the pandemic, we then we started doing Zoom reunions. And uh, everybody, you know, so many people were joining. And then that's the, when the idea of there has to be a book. We're going to have 50 years. And, you know, since we opened on Broadway and all of the people that were a part of this, and all of the people who, who contributed toward it becoming the world phenomenon that it became, uh, we, we need to put it all down on paper. So that's how the idea started. Well, actually, the 50th anniversary is Valentine's Day, uh, 50 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But because of COVID, you were not able to get together. Right. And so this idea, uh, the uh, brainchild uh, came out of a uh, COVID Zoom meeting. Uh, who says that brag ideas don't come out of Zoom meetings? Uh, but you were having this Zoom meeting. And who was the first person who said, let's write a book? Well, as I recall, I think it was Adrian Barbeau who made the comment that, you know, we should have a book. Uh, and then, you know, and then Tom and I jumped on the bandwagon. And then when we talked, kept talking about it with everybody, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. And, um, you know, we decided that uh, since we uh, couldn't do the anniversary on its date, February 14th, because people were still a little nervous mm -hmm. and people were hesitant to make plans for a big gathering, we decided to move it to June. You know, and, and that's why. And also, um, right from the beginning, Tom and Adrian and I, uh, you know, we said that this book, since everybody's working on it and everything, and we should, uh, the three of us, as the editors, authors, so to speak, um, are going to um, are going to uh, donate part of our royalties to the Actors Fund, because after all, everybody is unified by our concern and our uh, desire to prosper the the Actors Fund. 
God bless you for that. And uh, they're doing uh, great, great work. And uh, I want to go uh, back for a moment. As I said, uh, Tom and I had the great pleasure of speaking uh, just two nights ago. So we got a lot of the history of how we, how Greece began and everything. But I want to go back because uh, it truly uh, began somewhat with you, at least the road to Broadway begins with you, uh, because it began in Chicago. Uh, a friend told you about this production. Uh, you, my college, my college roommate, actually. Your college he was, roommate. He was there that summer um, studying, orth, uh, taking an orthodontry course. He'd become a dentist, yes. So you go to Chicago to see the show, and you saw the makings of a Broadway show. And if you can tell us a little bit about the road to get to New York yeah. and then what it was that you saw in Tom Moore, which of course is covered in the book, in what it was that you wanted him to be the captain of the ship, if you will, uh, to lead this show at forward. Well, here I was, you know, um, my friend, Phil Markin, calls me and says, you've got to come see the show. It's in a community theater. Um, it's playing on Friday and Saturday nights. He knew I was looking for a new show. I'd already done two productions. And um, since he uh, never was enthusiastic about anything, as a matter of fact, it got to the point where Phil would never say anything good about anything. He didn't want to ruin his reputation. So when he's so enthusiastic on the phone, I said, I'm going to go out. So he picked me up with his wife at the airport. We went to the Kingston Mines Theater, which was in the basement of an old trolley barn. They had no seats. They gave us newspapers to sit on. And I looked up and I saw all this brown painted paper scenery and I could see all the drip marks because the cast must have painted themselves. And I remember remarking to them, I said, when I was 12, 13 and 14, putting on shows in my basement theater, we had, we painted on, uh, on brown paper, but we never had any drip marks. But anyway, when the curtain went up, I saw my high school yearbook come to life. And it was, I knew every one of those people. And um, as it progressed, it was like 70 some percent of book and, the rest, uh, uh, music, some of the songs that we used were great songs. Some didn't make it to Broadway, but and new ones were written. Um, but I saw that Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey really had the talent to take this little gem and evolve it into a full Broadway musical. And But when I met with them back, back, uh, backstage afterwards, you know, I said, um, I said, the one thing that you've got perfect on this, I mean, some of the songs don't work and we have to fix this and that. Danny and Sam were sort of in the background. They had to be pulled out as the main central characters. But I said, the one thing that you got absolutely right was the total authenticity. I truly believed that every one of the people in this cast stayed in costume after the show, got into a jalopy and went out for hamburgers. Hmm. And that makes it different from spoofs like Games at Sea or anything else we could be compared to. Mm -hmm. be compared to. So I said, that we have to keep at all costs. So the choice of director, choreographer, the designers, everybody had to be chosen to contribute to keeping that um, authority, that, um, uh, um, that, that fact that they're real. And um, the first thing that happened while I was even sitting there was Pat Birch, because she can make actors look like dancers if Absolutely. they can move. And uh, we didn't want to have, in order to have this authenticity, we couldn't have a singing chorus or a dancing chorus. It was going to be these 16 characters. And um, uh, so, and the Me Nobody Knows, which I had seen shortly before I went out uh, to Chicago, was exactly that. You believe that the kids in that show that she choreographed and worked with came from the Bronx. They weren't performers, but actually they were performers. Um, Tom Moore, three years before that, uh, I had seen a play that he did uh, called Welcome to Andromeda. He directed it. It was one of those weekend things here in New York. And um, I had to pinch myself as I was watching it that these were actors because it was so real. And then the amount, only one actor could move because the other was a quadriplegic in a bed. And yet Tom had gotten so much humor out of that one actor that could move, you know, in this really uh, serious not very, um, you know, happy uh, premise of this show. So um, I never forgot that. And as we were thinking about directors, um, it suddenly, uh, you know, three years later, but I suddenly remembered Tom Moore. And um, we had met with him. We liked him a lot after that play. And I had uh, had a long, long lunch shortly after that with him in LA. So somewhere I knew someday we were going to work together. 
And, uh, but I did two, two shows and then came this one and he was totally right for this. But at first we brought him in to meet everybody. But then Tom said, I don't know if I'm right for this because I didn't like those greaser kids. I was, I never related to them. Well, there he is. There he is. We were just talking about what a what a good time to make an appearance. Yeah. <laughs> entrance. Yes, you know how to make a great entrance. Yes, right? exactly. Just to appear just a little late. Come in when they're talking about you, so that Absolutely. you can smile, say hello to everybody. But make an entrance that's usually in a trapeze. We'd love that as well. <laughs> I would love to do that. Maybe that's what I should do for the party. Um, yes. <laughs> when we were driving Tom back to the airport after his first visit to New York, he said, I don't, as I just mentioned, I don't like those greasers. I don't know if I'm the right for this. And I said, Tom, you're going to make them likable, the casting and your work and so forth. Read it again on the plane. Just read the draft on the plane. And then I got a call when he lands. He runs to, I, I guess, you ran to a payphone, of course. We had them in those days. I hope you didn't talk me out. I hope I didn't talk you out of hiring me. So <laughs> We were in business. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to talk, I mean, as uh, Tom knows, and you do uh, also, Ken, uh, each day I choose a word of day. And the word that I chose for today, believe it or not, is service. And, the, and I chose this word because of the service that we bring to our jobs, what we bring to the business, what we bring to the show. And I'd like to talk about the service that each of you brought and what you brought to the table that propelled this closer to the show that we know today. And I'll start with you, Tom. Well, um, well, I don't know. It seems like the other person should be saying what you brought to the table uh, than the person himself. But I'll, I'll just base it on what Ken said he was looking for, just to tie it into that conversation. Uh, the way he convinced me that it was the right thing to do was because he said, you will be able to help the guys uh, reconstruct and and the script, which at that point was was 75% book, 25% musical, and no, no music survives if that's its proportion. And uh, I knew that was true. Uh, uh, and then he said, and indeed what he just said, you will make those kids likable. Uh, and I think that is what I brought. And he knew I had a good casting instinct and he knew I couldn't stand deadness on stage. So he, in a mad state of mind, it seems to me, was able to assume that what I did with two people could be transported to a cast of 16. Uh, but it turns out, I think he was right. <laughs> right. And Ken? Well, it turned out well. <laughs> Certainly did. Let's talk about some of the casting. Either of you can go first. Uh, well, well, casting, about. casting, I mean, I. I Casting for a director, and I mean, certainly for a producer, for, no director survives if he's got the wrong cast. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of bad directors survive if they've got a great cast, uh, because they, even if they bond against the director, they can bring it off. But, uh, but the casting instinct, I think, is the most important thing. And most directors who, who know what they're doing will tell you that it's least, at least 80% of their work if you make that right choice Not we were very collaborative in casting you know the thing that's important to remember is that it had to be and we always were very clear on this formula it was actors first singers second and then dancers and that's the way the balance went you hope there'd be a triple threat but very few people are a total triple threat and you know the ones that were became superstars and the the proofs in that pudding as well uh, but the cast was incredibly thorough and ken and i laugh now but we certain the casting directors didn't laugh but we were always saying to them no nope, there are more people out there we need to find them because we have not found that you know i look and then i'll turn it over to ken but i look for someone that first as soon as they walk onto that stage in some way they grab my attention i'm not talking about theatrics i'm just talking about it could be a sense of self it could be a sense of voice it could be a sense of energy some people can walk into a space and suck the energy out of it within seconds other people fill it with with energy i mean i just have to do this one story uh because a, a, a vaudevillian who was near the end of his life said you know the secret to an audition is to go into that space 
as if you've just come from somewhere fantastic and you're delighted to share the time with them. But it's not everything to you because when you leave, you're going to another place equally fantastic. And I think that is a brilliant piece of advice. That's who you want to work with. You don't want to work with the people that you don't want at the party. You want to, you want to go where they're going. You know, you want to play with them. We, what we great are, advice. We that, are, it was, that was Eric, Eric Christmas. Some people will know him. He was a, he was a great Canadian actor who didn't work in America wow. um, and did all, all the classic roles. We auditioned over a thousand people for that original cut. Uh, because we were looking for, as Tom just said, actors first. You got to be a terrific actor if you make the audience think you're not an actor, and that's what we were after. And I knew Tom could achieve that because he did with the play that I saw, and um, uh, and the work he was doing with with Jim Warren on getting getting the musical, the full musical script. Um, you know, all those elements were were in there, and. Next, they had to be singers. They had to really make you believe they could sing these rock and roll songs from the 50s. And then third, they had to move well enough for Pat Birch to make them look like real dancers. And that's, you know, we went through so many people to find that. And of course, when you find that, you're really going to have a cast. When you narrow it down to 16, you're going to have a cast of extremely gifted and talented people. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why there was such camaraderie all the way through because they respect each other, besides being an ensemble. So there was no, like, one person sticking out. <clears throat> and also, um, it, it explains why so many people from Greece went on to major accomplishments in film, movies, uh, film TV, and other things. Absolutely. Uh, any comments that either of you want to make uh, that you recall from the audition process? Anything that particularly stands out? as far as the acting process goes? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about that a little. Some of it is what I learned from the book when the actors, when the actors were writing their stories because uh, the only way we could do what we had to do, and it's, it's, it's not the way to do it, I'm the first to say, is that everyone ended up in the same room, which is the same theater, for those final auditions. It's just the only way we could do it. Yeah. Um, and it's painful. And to a certain extent, it's not fair to the actors. On the other hand, they all, the ones that came through, rose to that occasion, performed for those other actors, and ultimately got the part. But that's one of the things I most remember. And then I just, you know, the, the, the Pat Birch formula, which is a remarkable thing. Pat was always the one, one to have to compromise, because uh, that's just the way it always stood out. But she was also willing to. Because if she saw a terrific actor or a terrific singer, she'd say, they dance well enough. You know, I'll make it work. And she always did. And I think that's, that's what allowed us to do that strict formula. Uh, because with somebody else, they would have been fighting tooth and nail. And if we had cast dancers who had that extraordinary dance ability, they wouldn't have been those characters we saw. Um, but uh, actors are very vulnerable when they come in to audition. It's a, it's a tough process. And uh, I just remember too, it was endless. It was endless then, it was endless next year, it was endless the second year, and it was endless the seventh year when we were casting, uh, because we never stopped trying to get the best we could find. We come out of the auditions with headaches, I'll tell you, really, major <laughs> headaches. You know, it's so funny because um, we're not particularly these actors, I know, but actors in general, you know, they think when they come into an audition, you can't wait to say thank you move on. I'm telling you, every person that came in, we were hoping and hoping was the exact person we wanted because those endless auditions made us nuts. <laughs> well, speaking of exact actors, when did you know that you had your exact actors uh, with the original cast? Uh, can I give a version, then you can give a version, but I, I don't think we knew it until we made the final decision right before we went into rehearsal. Uh, you know, and because we we did a lot of mix and matching. I mean, one of the things that would happen in those final auditions is that we pair off different people, and boy, were there some talented people that that weren't in that original incarnation show. Uh, some made it into later versions, but it was it was really down the wire. And the the choices that now seem inevitable and frankly are the reason the show is successful did not seem so at the time. You just had to say. 
is the way I think we go. When I when I cast in a group like that with a musical, it's very different than a play. But when I cast like that in a musical, uh, it's very important to me that there be consensus. I mean, uh, because we all fight very hard for the things we need. I mean, choreographer fights for what they need. The producer fights for what they think is right. And I do too. But if you if you do it right as a director, then you you ultimately seduce them into it. And by that, I don't mean that I did anything. I just mean you keep showing them things that actor can do to prove that what you think is right is right. And you know what you need to do. But if they, there was never a cast that was a consensus between Ken and Maxine, Pat Birch, the musical director, Louis St. Louis, and myself. And the authors. And the authors, sorry. Um, that goes without saying. And one of the um, mystery, one of the things I remember very, very well, we were down to, we had pretty much agreed on the whole cast, except we hadn't agreed yet on Danny Zuko. Barry Bostwick had come in and played um, uh, audition for Teen Angel, actually, right here, in one of the auditions. Uh, so we had talked about a James Dean kind of looking like for Danny Zuko. And I remember we were down to the wire, we all knew that Barry was sensational, so for his auditions and whatnot. So we're sitting in my office at the end here, and we're talking about James Dean and Danny Zuko, and who can be. But somebody said, and I don't remember who, but somebody said, why does Danny Zuko have to look like James Dean? Why can't Danny Zuko look like Barry Boswick? <laughs> and, that, and I remember that was it. Well, if I may, if I might jump in here just to show the differences in history, I never. I never thought that James Dean image. That was never anything I was looking for. I the way I remember it, there was another actor up against Barry. Yes, and and it, a wonderful. Went yeah, on Dean. to have a terrific. I'm not going to mention the name. Went on yeah, James Dean a fabulous career, and he certainly looked to the part of James Dean. But that was not that was not within my calculations at all. But there was only ultimately one person that. We thought, and it turns out to be right uh, yeah. in a big way, was Barry because we knew that he would be able to take it. He would be able to rise above the material, the other actors, <laughs> the 50s, and deliver something that would uh, change the show. No, that, that, was, that was true, but I do remember that meeting. I remember that meeting because everybody. Yeah, maybe, but, yeah. I, but, that was, but like yeah. a lot of meetings, somebody yeah. may have said that, but I was not thinking that. Because the other person was being compared to that meeting. One we mentioned to James Dean. Finally, somebody said, "Why does you know, have to look like James Dean? Why not Barry Bostwick?" And we all like, "Whoa!" I mean, it was the end of any discussion. You might have been leaning that way, but it was the end of any discussion. I wasn't leaning that way. <laughs> I was, well, hello, uh, hello, it was Barry. Just a matter of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, that solved that whole thing for you, uh, Barry. I think you're muted. First of all. Uh, Yes. Uh, Turn your microphone on. Uh, you're muted. If you can, he's muted. Here. Oh, I know. Not sure how to get through to him on that. Uh, uh, turn uh, your microphone on. Uh, uh, there you are. There he goes. Hello, Barry. Oh, there you are. Welcome. I, uh, I I I didn't realize Ken didn't want me, and you wanted me. No, Don. no, no, I wanted you. No, 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 no. You wanted <laughs> Richard Gear. I know you wanted Richard Gear. Well, well, the, the only way to explain that was Richard, Richard Gear was not in those auditions. He, he didn't audition. No. Oh. no that was much later. Larry, he came much later to, to replace as understudy uh, Jeff Conaway, who we were sending on the road. Oh, I see. I see. Well, I love them both. You know, yeah, I, I was I was in service. Can you hear me? I was in service to Tom, Ken, Maxine, uh, and everybody involved in this. They're talking about service, and to my history of the fifties and uh, what I remembered from the fifties, uh, because of my older brother and this and that. So we were really close to the actual 50s, uh, you know, gestalt, whatever that means. Uh, and uh, uh, so we were able to, I think, bring to it a certain uh, uh, humanity and realistic, uh, you know, uh, history to it. Um, 
I still want to know uh, who the other person was. Well, I think I, I told you once, but I think you've forgotten. So now, now you're going to have to live with that a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, forgotten, my God. I don't. My yeah. was really interested in that person. And I, oh, and it turns out no, that's that not true, Barry. Just to know how hard you had to work. He he was right in there, right up until that last. But he did, yeah, he was a picture till the end. But well, I gotta say, I gotta say, talk about service. I mean, you guys serviced my life at that time when we were in our mid twenties, playing sixteen. You know, and it just never stopped. I mean, all of us in that original cast, uh, we you just created careers for us because of, uh, you know, of your uh, brilliance and uh, instinct. Richard, one of the things um, that came up, of course, people were asking us, asking me, you know, how come you're not going to go after your high school kids? Because you're talking about the 50s high school. I said, because high school kids on stage look like days. Yeah. And if you think that we're getting a huge echo here, Ken, I don't know why. I'm echoing. Yes. yes. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I hear what, what, uh, what Ken is saying. In addition to to the look of high school kids, they didn't have the skills. No. Because the skills uh, were only attained by a certain amount of experience. And, and and all of our grief research had been around on the top. Not a lot. But it's not figured out. My point was that when you hang around, if you picture the kids you went to high school with, you picture them as contemporaries. You picture them still your age. You don't picture them as babies. And we wanted to create that. Absolutely. So, Barry, when we came in to audition, were you given any parameters on what they were looking for as far as the character was concerned? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think I just, uh, uh, I think I came in with a guitar and I just played something on my guitar, like, uh, I forget what it was. But um, uh, that's what we did back then, whether you're doing Godspell or hair or any of that kind of stuff. You know, every, all of us young people in New York were auditioning for everything that we could get our hands on. And... Um, um, uh, some of us were lucky enough to have some experience before Greece, so we had some, uh, not only life experience, but stage experience. And, um, uh, and I, I think one of the most important things that we all learned was just how damn hard it was and tiring it was to do eight shows a week of this show, which was so high energy, and we were smoking at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> which was hellish. I mean, we were losing our voices at least once a month, everybody, you know, so the understudies went on an awful lot because of all the falsetto stuff, and we were smoking real cigarettes, and um, uh, so we're all going to die. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You missed that moment, Barry. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, Ken, when you, you missed that moment of dying young. Oh, uh, well, well, thank you. When you saw the show, uh, it was more than ensemble. Uh, Danny and Sandy were part of the ensemble, and you fleshed those characters out more. The writers. Well, it, seemed, it seemed like they were crying to be the central characters. I mentioned to you more that night. You know, I said they needed to be pulled out. Um, they were there asking to be the leads, but they weren't. So you knew what you were looking for in Danny. Did you know what you're looking for as far as Sand was concerned? Well, I, uh, Tom might have had a, a conception in his head when we went into auditions, but I think we were looking for someone who would be the innocent girl that we wanted. And you found her. <laughs> there she is. I, I see what you're doing, Richard. I see how you're interviewing people. You're waiting to bring them up. We were looking at me. Let me say now that we see Carol. We were looking for a beautiful girl who had life and energy and joy and extreme skill in acting in things. Yes. 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 And you found her. And you found her. We did. Now, Carol, you're now, muted, Carol, muted as well. As well. Okay. Wait. Okay, wait. Okay. Yeah. 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 Here she is. Hello. Hi. Hi. Carol. Well, it's very interesting that you talk that Barry just said something about um, wanting to put the front was over or not. It 
it's too late to think about dying young. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, think, I think everybody stopped smoking. Right. Well, I think what she's saying is we're not young. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My father bribed the four of us to keep us from smoking. He put, you know, there were four of us. He was trying to stop. He had ulcers. He was trying to stop. He'd come back from World War II. This is in the back of Greece, but it's just interesting that he really, it really worked. Because um, he'd been smoking on the streets of Brooklyn since he was 15. He was a lawyer. He was smoking and secret service he was still smoking he um he put a hundred dollar bill on the table and we had never seen one we were all really fascinated and he said if you reach 18 and you haven't smoked you get one of those and if you make it to 21 you get another this is the thing so we all did oh that's great uh, Carol, I want to ask about your audition process. When you first auditioned for Sandy, did you have any idea of what you wanted to bring to the table as Sandy or what they were looking for as Sandy? Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, for one thing, I I, I kept looking at, at, the, at the story, you know, at this boy who was obviously the leader of the pack and charismatic and powerful in his own way. And he had this summer with this girl who wasn't like any of the girls in his life and his, you know, in his group. And he obviously impressed her. So he had another side. I mean, I think Sandy, to see him how he was on an ordinary day would have run the other way, you know. But he, but he showed her a side of himself that was not the usual. Uh, the not, not his usual image. And I thought to myself, what is it about her? Why does he go out of his way to, to pull this other part of himself out to be with her when he can have anybody? Because he's really, you know, he's really beautiful and he's, and all the girls want him. So why is he doing this? And I thought, well, you know, I have to, I have to pull something from her. She has to shine. She has to be far more sensual than you expect. And she has to have a, you know, a light inside. She has to have a fire. But she even needs to have a, a kind of sexuality that's that's very much her own. And so, and I looked at the other characters and I thought, if I can't pull this off, I'm gonna get lost here. Because they're all so cool. They're so interesting. You know, they, they're all very magnetic and here, this, this girl could be wallpaper if, if I can't, you know, pull something out of that makes him want her, or that makes him understand why he wanted her. So that was part of what I did. The other part was, okay, I'm a color or a soprano. I've sung the Fantastics at Sullivan Street for two years and gone back in when they needed me. You know, I've been, I've played roles in, in theaters in Milwaukee and in Seattle and here, there, and the other place. Um, and I, and I want this, I want, I, I want this Broadway job. So I, I think they, I thought when they see me, you know, what I look like. And when they, when they look at my resume, they're going to see Soprano. What do I do about that? <laughs> Cause obviously that's not what she is, you know? And it actually, it actually turned out great. And it's in the book actually that, mm -hmm. um, Lewis is worried about that too. So he brought me in privately and he just put me through the ringer. He made me sing everything he could think of. He made me sing every voice, every note my voice could make. And he asked me to, you know, bring back a certain kind of song. So I sang, I, I didn't know any of my song. I sang, uh, I don't know how to love him from Jesus Superstar. Superstar. Yeah. yeah. And he was satisfied when I left. So whatever they did with him, and he said to me, I don't he, that he wasn't totally sure everything about everything that Sandy would be singing. But he said, Oh, you can do this. My voice teacher, Felix Knight, who was amazing, wonderful, bless his spirit every day, uh, said, You know, the, the things are changing on Broadway. We're going to have to do something. I'm going to teach you how to sing best voice like a tenor guy, so that we won't let all the work we've done. And he taught me how to get up there and make a, make a sound that was appropriate 
for this. It was, it was a preparation for things to come and this came and the timing was right. And I was getting nervous because I know I'm, I, I'm older than all of the other kids. And uh, that didn't seem to be wrong. So I thank you, um, and I thank you again for, for having faith in me. That well, thank you, Carol. I, 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 our ideal first, Sandy. Thank you. Wow, we all thank you. That's great. <laughs> and any of you can get on this. What do you want to tell us about a uh, uh, Patty Simcox? Uh, well, the Patty Simcox we cast, I can just talk to you about the fact that uh, that we cast her in the, in, in, in the term of uh, Patty Simcox, we didn't cast older. She was a good 10 years younger than the rest of the cast. And, uh, and uh, that became both the challenge and the joy of it. Because at one point, I mean, she tells a wonderful story in the book, about uh, about the, the struggles coming with Patty, she was having none of it, and I see she's now on screen, so we should let her take this. So. She did not. Let me just put it this way: where I grew up in Brooklyn, there were no cheerleaders. <laughs> I, I really, I literally didn't know one one cheerleader, but um, I knew. You know, I felt very confident auditioning for the role. I had done this comedy review around the country. I had worked with Michael Bennett, and I had done some stuff, but I was doing a lot of comedy, so I felt confident that I could get some, you know, some laughs, and I, I felt good about all the auditions. I feel like I picked the right stuff, but on the first day of rehearsal, everything went like that. I felt like, I, I felt like Patty is going against traffic, and I wanted to be part of the gang. I wanted to be the, you know, the groovy chick. Because I always thought of myself as the groovy chick. And all of a sudden, you know, um, I'm kind of the um, preppy, um, somewhat of not a little obnoxious. Um, and but you know, I had gotten a review once that that I had to remember this. It said that uh, Eileen looks like she knows all the dirty verses to the old gray mare and just won't tell. You. <laughs> so I had to start incorporating that review that I got when I was 16 years old into this. Um, and you know, Tom and I, Tom and we used to sit on the balcony, and, and you know, he thought it was because I was young. It was that I was young. I just wasn't around these kind of preppy types, and I was like this beatnik. And um, and I watched American Bandstand. I, you know, I really you knew my fifties music. Uh, not that it was my favorite music, because I was like a bus no kid. I was trying to teach myself like um, Portuguese, um, you know. Uh, 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 Mendez, you know, Brazil 66 song, but that's the way I kind of saw, but, um, Tom was so helpful. And then just, you know, hanging out with Barry a little, I felt like all of a sudden I'm his cheerleader, you know, I'm the cheerleader and Carol, you know, we assume roles. It was really interesting how it's very hard on that first day of rehearsal to get it really quickly. And sometimes it's hard the first four days. You, you, you don't feel comfortable with certain things. I, as I say in the book, I, I never said, oh, goodness gracious. Those words never came out of my mouth. But all of a sudden, you assume the position. <laughs> you know, I just have to say, those sessions in the balcony at the Eden Theater were some of my wow. favorite moments of rehearsal. Um, because Eileen grew to just expect it. So, you know, whenever we had a little break, Eileen, let's go up and just talk a little bit about, about Patty. And it was just great fun. Yeah. Well, thank you. You know, thank you for casting me. Yeah. And I'm going to bring another what, element into you. our mix. Look who is here. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Hey, Alan Paul. Alan Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can unmute yourself. You're muted. The microphone. Here we go. Yes. Hello. Welcome. First of all, I'm glad you made it on. Uh, nice to be here. 
you know, what are your recollections, first of all, of when you first heard about the show and your auditions to come in and audition for the show? Uh, well, my manager had called me and uh, she said there was an audition for the show called Reese. And so immediately I thought, well, this was about, uh, this is like a remake of Throw of the Greek. <laughs> You're on your way to Mykonos. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 it's some kind of 50s thing. I did. She said, do you know any 50s songs? I said, yeah, I know some 50s songs. So, um, I want to ask, do you have any other windows open? Because I think that's why we're getting the echo. Um, to me? Yes. Yeah, I might. Hold on a second. You know, Alan? Yes. Yeah, you're lucky. I almost got the part. Well, you know, this is all total news for me. Mary. Yeah, well, me too. I didn't even know I was up for your part. I didn't know that either. Well, I'm so glad you got it because you were excellent at it. You know, okay. and I, you did you fly uh, in on a rope or something? Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> me and the rope. Yes. yes. Well, I have a question. I never. I, I don't know exactly why you hired me, guys. Well, why you, I, you, I couldn't hear that. Why did you hire me? Because you, because you, you looked fantastic and you had a fantastic voice. Yeah. And those were the two unassailable requirements for that role. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my experience. I don't know how to get rid of this. Um, the echo here. Sorry. Um, but at the time, you know, I was, uh, I had just gotten out of college. I, I was a music teacher. Um, and really that was my main focus was to, to do music. Um, but I had done theater as well. I mean, when I was 12, I was in the original cast of Oliver on Broadway. And so I had that, you know, as a teen and, and, and that I had that experience, but I wanted to go and study music. Um, and to support myself, I was singing up in the Borscht Belt. All right. So I was, I was kind of, I was doing that. I, I think I was doing what Johnny Casino was. I was singing at wedding compartments and up in the castle. And, um, you know, from, uh, from Jim Jacobs' perspective, you know, Johnny, Johnny Casino, Casino was Clarence. Clarence. He was like <laughs> kind of weird kind of guy, kind of guy that lived in his own world and stuff like, like that. that. But I, I, just I just remember I went in on a Friday and, I was just, and then we started rehearsals on Monday. And I was like totally shocked. I, I say it in the book, I was totally shocked because I had auditioned for Jesus Christ Superstar. And I got called back six times and then they fired the director and then hired Tom O'Horton and he came in and I had this like a whole bunch of other times and he wound up hiring everybody that wasn't here. So I didn't get anything and I was so frustrated. I said, you know, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm going to put this business. But then it just happened. I didn't know you were in college protege. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I was I was in that show with with Georgia Brown, and Claude Revel, and Davy Jones. Yes. Well, yes. Huh. So if you can try to figure out if there are any other windows open, that'll get rid of the echo that we're getting here. And I've got some questions that I want to ask each of you, uh, just uh, as we. Uh, Richard, Richard, right before right before you do that, we've just had another member of our cast join in Eileen's window, and yes. that's. Muse Small, who was oh. the original Hello there. Hey, Hello. Uh, Hi. It's good to see you. I've been listening. <laughs> well, welcome aboard. Yeah. I, I tell you, can I tell you what got Maria? Well, she, she went by Maria, but she's now Muse. But, uh, but Ken and Maxine had gone down to see her perform in a small show. Way, 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 way off. I want to straight that chair, right? And yes, I was in the boy on the street back there no, back backstage one night. I said, should I should come and audition for Greece? <laughs> and I was uh, I was only doing boy on the straight back chair because I was worked out of town for nine years and I thought you have to stay in town 
and even if you're going to work in this show for five dollars a week and drive a cab and work as a hat check girl and two other jobs you're going to stay in new york until you get a broadway show and so i was thrilled that you asked me and i went right over there and i when i saw the other actors i was like flabbergasted i was like i could every barry carol Eileen, Katie Hanley, I just, uh, Kathy Moss, and Tim Myers, every single one, I just was, I said, these people are just amazing. And uh, I jumped up to them. That's amazing. Oh, just a moment, Ken, I had you muted, sorry. Uh, now Ken, speak. Oh, oh yes, uh, no, Maxine and I were like, this is a Frenchie, this is a Frenchie. So we went right over to her, got her information and everything told Tom that we found somebody who's got to audition. And uh, you you came into what, a regular audition or? or... Well, I remember going to seven auditions, but I, I you somebody, you all say that there weren't that many auditions. That's, that's what I remember. <laughs> Not seven, no. <laughs> well, it seemed like there were a lot and each one of us was, was absolutely fabulous. And there was a line along the block, you know, around the block to, for people auditioning. But you, you remembered me when I came in, so it was... It was well, the nice. reason we remembered you, and am I, I'm not muted, right? No, no. you're okay. not. The, the reason, uh, when, Ken, when Ken told me, and then he said, we're very excited about her. You know, she's coming, she's coming. Kim, I think he said it three times. <laughs> sure enough, we were in, for some reason, we were in the lounge of the Eden Theater yeah. doing these auditions. And all of a sudden, we hear this voice coming down the stairs laughing and then this this the very very pretty girl you know kind of swaying on it seems to me heels but maybe you weren't and laughing the entire time as you came down those steps and by the time you landed quite frankly i think you had already had the role before you read <laughs> wow. Wow. wow she was like a, she was like a teenage um ruth gordon yeah it's that's true. amazing that's great absolutely true how long was the audition process? Um, that's forever, forever. It for was forever. But I, in terms of actual time, I, it may have been, a, it was certainly over a period of two weeks, but it may have been over three that, weeks. It was oh. almost the whole month of December. Before. You think it was? Yeah. Maybe it was. I'll tell. Oh, I tell you what, Ken's right. Because I was working on the script with Jim and Warren at the same time, and we worked a month on the script. So yeah. that's exactly what it took is a month. Wow. Well, I want to ask each of you a question as we wrap up. And I want to let everyone know that tomorrow night you are going to be celebrating. Uh, most of you are going to be at Feinstein's 54 Below tomorrow night. Am I correct? That's yes. Right. Uh, which of you are going to be there tomorrow night? Hands raised. Great. So, Barry, we're going to miss you tomorrow night. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but um, I'll start with you, Ken. Um, Working on this book, when did you feel that the book was ready for it to be in our hands? Because there's so many great stories, and I know some stories did not make it to the book. When did you feel that it was ready to go to the publisher? Well, um, it was an excruciating process. Tom played director. Like, you know, everybody wrote their stories. We would look them over. Adrian and I would discuss everything, Tom and I discuss it you know this gets repetitive or this or that then tom would go back and give notes to everybody to make changes or to edit or do what you know so it was almost like a production at a time there was one moment when tom and i talked to each other on the phone and we said we feel like we're out of town working on a, like a show not a book because we went through all of those kind of processes but everybody was so cooperative and when tom went back to each writer each contributor you know to, give us notes or the simple five things or whatever, he, whatever we needed. Um, everybody was just inspired and, and cooperative. It was terrific. Now, Tom, last night you said uh, to me, uh, or night before last, that you're really already looking uh, with melancholy to this period being over. There's so many things that are happening. You've got a reunion evening coming up at uh, Sardis and so many other things that are happening. Um, Looking back over the process uh, from the book, uh, you know, being written now, what is the biggest 
uh, high that you've had on this process right now? Well, the actual, the actual person, I remember saying that and thinking, but that's rather indulgent, saying that I'm already anticipating the melancholy. But, but um, it was Barry, actually, in a very short note. He was very complimentary about the book, but he said, uh, what you're about to experience must also be goodbye. And uh, that's really what started me thinking about that. And it's absolutely true. It's with these two weeks. I mean, who would think? I thought I'd said goodbye, you know, 40 years ago. And I didn't think about Greece for those intervening decades, except when I ran into friends. But he's right. Uh, uh, I, I will be saying goodbye. Uh, this will be the last major thing I certainly focus on with Greece. And, uh, and, and, and just to, to elaborate on what Ken said for just a second, the, uh, some people helped us in the book. Because, because we had we lost, lost some of the activity and we had a straightforward chronology, and which was what I'd always assumed it would be. And, and we decided, decided we needed to have some people look at it with the publisher So, so a group of six people, people professional, professional, nobody connected with the show, um, took a look at it and gave us some serious And, and, and although they loved the book, they said everybody would want to read this. They said this is where it becomes repetitive. And we, and we went, went back, back. And if you look, look at the, at the last, last third of the book, book the structure changes in that, in that last, last third of the book. book. So, so we're just, just about, about the time you think, think I've been here before. before. Uh, I, don't I don't want to do this, this with one more company. company. We, we change, change the structure, structure and make it by event. For, for instance, it's about, about the drug event, event, and you have a bunch of Zucos talking about Barry and driving. So, so yes, it will be hard for me to say goodbye. First of all, these are many of my closest friends, and we've shared an incredible, I mean, very few people uh, stay in touch with the show for 50 years uh, at the unit. And this is a true hat. And it was true for every single company. They formed their own type of family, and then that became a gigantic family. I could go on and on about this, and make it to an extent at the dinner. <laughs> but that, that, that's enough to now. Great, great. Uh, I mean, what is the one thing that you've learned about yourself from the book that surprised you the most? About myself? You know, that you learned uh, looking back on this period in your life? Well, I, I was dealing with some personal things in my personal life that I talked about. Uh, in the book a bit um, with a boyfriend that was um, very jealous of all this was attention. So that, and I, I said, I've got to tell the truth about this. So I was kind of proud of myself for doing that. That was a little scary. Um, I love ensemble. I love ensemble. I, you know, that somebody wanted me to do this one person show, and I'm like, uh uh, I don't know, we're not doing that. You know, I like that, that feeling of, of working with, with people, and, and we were all on an equal footing in, in many ways, and I like that. That's and great. And it took over with me when I did, when I did Ryan Cole. I took that with me to create ensemble that nobody was the star, that we were all part of an ensemble. Uh, Maria, same question for you. Yes? Same yes, question. looking back on this period, <coughs> something that you learned again about yourself that really surprised you, looking back? From doing the book? Yes. From doing the show? Look, yeah, doing the book. <laughs> I had some fabulous experiences and to be able to, to write them and tell those stories. Uh, I don't know if we Nirvana stories even in the book. I just started to read it. And, uh, but did I have with Kathy and Tim, Tim White driving down the highway and we were, we were a hit. I mean, I, I, just, I, I love everybody in this show. I loved them from the moment I saw them and I watched them I just, and I just was like, I fell in love with one after the other and I stayed in love for 50 years. And uh, to be able to 
write about that. And then the fact that I live in Hell's Kitchen, then I walk to the theater every night, and on the way there, I can hear these beautiful sounds of Alan Paul rehearsing this little thinking group that, of course, came to Patty Frankfurter. And, you know, see the blocks of theater, you would use these different harmonies and beautiful things. And it was just, it was one of the most wonderful experiences of my life. And, of course, working with Kim Camming, this is heaven on earth. You know, what an amazing human being. And uh, everybody, everybody, you know, Adrian, of course, have become a very best friend for many, many years. Standing in the woods and watching her thing that works things every night, and it was a night I couldn't cry. Just was. Uh, and watching the various improvements in the auditions and the, in the process of doing the show, I was awestruck. You're one of the most creative people I've ever known in my entire life. Ever. And there it was, you know, we were in some art studio or someplace where I couldn't see you. I was watching you do it right on the spot with like everybody, you know. That's wonderful. Um, we're going to give away a book. I'm going to uh, do this right now. Uh, we're going to uh, see who is going to get the book tonight. Uh, we will do this here. We're going to see who will get this book. And then I'm going to give each of you a chance uh, to have your final word tonight. And uh, William Verrigan is our winner. So William, if you will contact me, somebody here has another window open. Uh, you've, you've got two windows open here. That's why we're getting the echo here. So I don't know who has the other window open here. Uh, that's why we're getting, everything is coming in twice here. So, uh, you know, just if you've got a something, we're getting feedback, awful feedback tonight. So uh, it's really distracting. So in any case, um, I want to thank every, uh, I'm going to mute everyone for just a moment so that I don't hear the feedback. Thank you. So. Everyone, uh, thank you for being here tonight. I, I want to thank you uh, for tuning in. I'm going to give everybody a chance to have your final word tonight. Uh, I will start with you, Tom. Uh, then we will go to uh, Ken. Did I leave Ken? I think we lost him. Hopefully, he'll come back. Uh, we'll go to Barry. Uh, then we'll go to Al, uh, Eileen, Maria, and Carol. You'll have the final word tonight. Uh, I'll, start I'll start with you, with you Tom, Tom, and uh, it's all yours. Well, if I, if I, be, if I was picking one of those pictures to get their words tonight, I would say thank you. I'm grateful to have been, to have been given, given this opportunity and to have collaborated with all these people uh, in such a fruitful, uh, not only successful show, uh, 120,000 versions of the show and count, but as a long friend. Who is next? Well, do I have to speak now? Yes, yes you, have you have to speak now. now. Oh, my God. Okay. First of all, Tom Moore, Ken, all you guys, you know, you've, you've, you've changed thousands of people's lives, and you've created you know, a world uh, that uh, so many actors and designers and, uh, never thought they'd have. Uh, so you are to be congratulated and honored uh, for what you've done for them. Uh, Carol, uh, on the other hand, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm sorry that I ignored you on the first day of rehearsal. Uh, apparently, in the book, I, uh, I came into rehearsal uh, and and I didn't speak to you. And we were obviously we had had an affair and we're having an affair at the time, apparently. And uh, and uh, I totally ignored you. And my God, I'm so sorry for that. That's just my social anxiety and my uh, and my uh, wanting to uh, be, uh, you know, in front. And uh, and you were always my good girl. You were always my sweetheart. You were uh, 
and um, uh, and so I apologize uh, for uh, ignoring you. The, did I talk to you the second day? <laughs> no. What an asshole! Jesus. But Barry, Barry, I read that. I thought that um, it was you playing Danny Zuko. Oh, yeah. Because after all, he was embarrassed. He thought I was friends by him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I tell you. I, I always, I, uh, the thing that I've gotten most from this show is that I say, oh, yeah, I created the part that uh, uh, John Travolta played in the movie. <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of that. I thought John was brilliant, by the way. I thought he was wonderful in the movie. He had that, he had that sweetness uh, and that, uh, I don't know if I had or not, but I mean, he had that guile guileness. I don't know. He was wonderful in it. Well, Carol, and, to think, and to think that Alan Carr was pushing Donnie Osmond to be Danny Succo at one point. Donnie Osmond? No. God. Can you imagine? No, no, no. You had to have that, that little well, boy was, thing. What happened was we used a little sort of blackmail because Alan owed his money. And I knew if uh, we didn't agree to let him wait, it, uh, oh, he would go to Robert Stigwood. John had mentioned that Robert Stigwood was giving him a future deal. So I put the I put it all together and he said, uh, Alan, you gotta pay you off to go find him. And he went to Wood and came to see the show at the Royale. And then afterwards his PR guy called me and said, Well, I took him there and he said, This is be a great role for him. I said, Well, you're gonna get a call from Alan Carr. Oh. Uh-huh. I don't know what happened to our And we were spared that last. He's gone. (laughs) Carol, it's your turn to speak and unmute yourself. If anything, I'm rarely speechless. I'm speechless in this in this situation where, where Barry said what he said. It was very hard and that was very kind of him to do and to do it so publicly. No one in the cast knew that I had ever even seen him before. Even even Eileen, who was my, my roommate, we shared a dressing room. I never told her. She didn't she didn't know. And it was just something that was that mystified me. But you know, from the first minute I saw Barry on stage, it was in something else. He walked on stage in these leather pants, which went on for about 10 miles. And he stood there in this light. And I thought, holy crap, look at this man. He is gorgeous. He is beyond gorgeous. And I, and then, you know, we got to know each other. And, um, and even at the audition, he, he was very kind to me because it's in the book. But he said... They put us together. So obviously, Ken, you were working on the chemistry, as you, as you and Tom have said, and they put us together to dance. And of course, I'm like a little more than 5'3", and he's 6'4", right? So he said to me, he whispered in my ear, he said, stand on my feet. So he stood on his feet, my arms up, you know, around his neck. And we just, we danced like that. But the chemistry that you were looking for was already there. And that's why when we walked into rehearsal the first day, and it was like he never saw me before in his life. I still, he still doesn't understand it, and I'll tell you, I don't either. But he's, he's, he's totally forgiven, and, and I have to say that I am so grateful for every single person in this cast. I was in high school. I graduated in 1957. I walked into that room. Everybody was, you know, we did that first reading, and I thought. This is incredible. I mean, everybody was so on. And everybody was not only equally talented, but it was clear that we we were going to be a really fine ensemble. And we we loved each other all through that time, on stage, off stage. Everybody pulled their weight. Everybody brought something really amazing and spectacular to their roles. It's still so vivid to me. I don't think, you know, I, I had done a lot of shows up till then. Nothing, nothing struck me that way. Not only for the authenticity, which happened so quickly, 
I loved all the guys here and I hated to see them have to part with it. God, I, they, they had hair, you know, they were beautiful. Everyone was in their own way. And nobody was, um, was difficult. You know, nobody was a problem. And I'm, and I don't mean by that, that it was all there. I mean, it was on fire. It was, you know, it was big compatibility. It was, it was gorgeous. And it, it changed my life and it changed me. And I, I'm forever grateful. And I had no idea that Sandy was going to become what she did become. Jim Jacobs said to me once, Sandy has, he didn't say morphed, he said evolved. Because I don't think anybody quite expected that the Danny Sandy thing was going to be so meaningful to audiences. So it became, you know, you know, she got a song, she got, she got other things as, as time went on. But I'm I'm glad to have been there at the beginning because it was we made something grow, we made something happen that's still growing. And you know, I I love everyone still. I walked into a little rehearsal today. I mean, was there other people were there? Just looked at each other and you thought, and it was like no time had passed. It was extraordinary. Barry, I don't know if you're still here. I don't know what I'm doing. I said. Yeah. What? That was the game. And then I for it. Alan, Alan, I remember hearing that you were using your Greece salary to form this singing group. And then, of course, it turned out to be the Manhattan Transfer. You're, you're <laughs> muted. You're muted. I can say that if it, if it wasn't for Greece, the Manhattan Transfer wouldn't exist because uh, just the serendipity of it all and how the group uh, kind of got together because Laurel Massé, my, my partner, was, was dating uh, Roy Markowitz, who was the drummer in the show, and we were all hanging out. And um, yeah, and, and it was an idea that, that came and, um, you know, and it evolved out of that, you know, but, you know, it was interesting reading the book, too. I mean, I learned so many things, so many things that I had forgotten, you know, and it's so true that this is a family, you know, and and it's just such a uh, remarkable, unusual experience that 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 it's like that, you know. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, I'm very, very honored to, to be a uh, part of this, you know, to, to be connected with all of you, you know, um, and I can't wait to see you at Sardi's. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there for tomorrow. Uh, I really, originally I was, uh, you know, when Adrian called me, not, uh, when, um, yeah, called me and said, would you, would you be a part of this? And I said, sure. Yeah. And then my schedule changed and I, I couldn't, do it. but I'm so looking forward to seeing all of you. What are you wearing? Uh, good oh. question. <laughs> <laughs> yes I'm enough. Kidding. I'm only kidding. Nobody's going as greasers. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. no, no. But you know, you mentioned family and yeah. that that's true because when fam, when you meet family people, it's like you were speaking yesterday. There's no time difference. You know, it's like, oh, like the last time we spoke was yesterday is what it feels like. And that's the way it is with everybody in Greece. Whenever I see or speak, you know, it's like we spoke yesterday, even if we haven't spoken in a few years, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And we've connected over the years, like you said. I mean, you know, having all these reunions and get togethers, you know, um, it's really, really special, really, really something else. You know, I and I felt uh, so honored, so, so uh, happy to be in the show, you know, my experience. And and I think for all of us, especially in the original cast, to see each step, you know, to see where we started, you know, at the Eden Theater, which was kind of raw and funky, you know, and. Um, you know, not knowing what was going to happen, and then all of us kind of teaming together, and then moving up to to the Broadhurst, you know, and doing that, and then finally to the Royale, you know, and it was like we arrived, we did this, you know, 
when everybody thought, nah, you know, their, their noses were up, you know, this isn't Broadway. Who are these people? <laughs> you know, but we proved them wrong. You know, it's, it's astounding how many years. Um, You're the one that saw really us. That it's gone. Yeah. Hey, and you know what I realized also? I, uh, I am the longest. I have been in every single company, every single production of Greece. Every single one. Really? Really? Yes. How can that be? Yeah. What do you mean? Because um, in the, in the uh, uh, drive-in movie scene, Look. Oh, that's right. Look, yes. Sheila. Sure. That's right. That's right. It's Alan's voice. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this teenager was kind of looking over every production. <laughs> just don't tell me. Yeah. Anyway, I love you all. It's just so fabulous. You know, so wonderful. Well, we'll see you next week. Absolutely, positively. To the end of this week. Just, just exceptional group of people and that time and energy that was there and they've all become lifelong friends you know and even those people that have passed on are still in my heart and my thoughts yes. Yes. through the days they, they're with me and I'm it, it's I, I'm unbelievably grateful and and deeply touched in my heart by everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just quote my myself from a song that I'm going to be singing at Sardi's called 50 Years of Love. Um, when the day is done and I've run adrift, I think of Greece and my spirits lift. It's a situation fits like a glove, our 50 years of love. Yeah, 50 years. Wow. <sighs> love all of you so much. That's a great song, Eileen, and uh, it became the theme of our whole reunion party, 50 Years of Love. <laughs>